And I will talk a little bit about um, hypoelectricity of sums of squares, which is a, a really classical uh, subject in, in linear PDE. And for me, omega will always be a smooth manifold. And for every purpose here, not for the local ones, because this is really irrelevant uh, from, the, uh, from the local point of view, but when I, I'm going to, to talk about global stuff, and I will just for simplicity, always assume that all my manifolds will be connected and oriented. Okay, and, and, I'll, and I'll never explicit mention this. But, and I will pick a bunch of real smooth vector fields on my manifold, and we will assemble the sum of their squares. And we, we recall the main local result in, in, in this business, which is, of course, Hermander's theorem that says that if the Lie algebra generated by the vector fields spans the, the, the whole tangent space to the manifold uh, pointwise at every point, then P is hypolytic, meaning that for every open set in the manifold, whatever distribution U there, such that P of U is smooth, we actually have that U is itself a smooth function. And this is, a, this is local, uh, so it holds for every open set in, in our manifold, which is really much stronger than global hypolipticity, which is exactly the same, by definition, it's the same statement, but we, where, but we only look at the whole manifold as our open set. And we don't really expect that we have um, the sort of regularization in smaller open sets, okay? And, but I mentioned here Hormander's result, but I will be mostly interested in global hyperlipticity and what follows. And uh, let's see some, some results that are interested in such a phenomenon. They, they are usually um, studied in a torus. For instance, this result by Cordado and, and Jimonas, in which one takes vector fields of this form in a product of torus, um, in which we split the variables as t and x. And here, even if we have uh, directions in both t and x, the coefficients of the vector fields are, are only assumed to depend only on t. And we assume them to be real analytic. And also that these vector fields, they satisfy Hermander's condition. So in particular, we know that um, the sum of their squares is hypolyptic. But we also assume that this, the, if we take the, 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 the vector fields corresponding just to, to this part and we look at their family, then these, these are vector fields only in, in, in this vector of the torus. And we impose that they span the whole tangent space of this factor. And then we are able to conclude actually that P is globally analytic hypoelliptic in the, in the full product manifold. And it, it is known that Hermander's condition is not enough to, to ensure analytic hypoelliptic But here we are seeing uh, uh, an example where you can infer with additional hypothesis global analytic hypolyptic hypolypticity. And I also should mention that some generalizations of the previous result 
were done by Christ in 94, and also by Cordaro and Jimonas themselves um, some years later. And this is another gen generalization in which um, the authors uh, take a look at the same model of operator given by similar expressions, but they move to a manifold different from the, the, the donut, right? So they take uh, a real analytic compact manifold without um, uh, not assuming that it has any symmetries, but G is a compact Lie group and they take a family of real analytic vector fields on M. Um, a basis of uh, left invariant vector fields on G. And they assemble these vector fields. This is much like the... Uh, they are trying to mimic this expression for the vector fields, okay? but replacing these guys by a, a basis of left invariant vector fields on the Lie group like, like this. And also they assume that the, this coefficients are real analytic. And again, one assumes that these vector fields satisfy Hermander's condition everywhere and that the these vector fields which live only in the in the in this manifold they span the whole tangent space to that manifold at, at each point uh, excuse me i have a question i have a question yeah uh, how is the uh, group g related to the manifold m because you are uh, it's not it's, it's it's not related in any it, it, it's N and G are not related. What we are doing is that we are we are looking at operators defined on their Cartesian product. Yeah, but uh, here uh, when you define the Ys, you are adding the Xs to the Ws. Ws are vector fields on M. Xs are on the group G. Yeah, 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 but yeah. We 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 are identifying. We are identifying the. The tangent the space okay. to the product as the okay. direct sum of their tangent spaces. All right. Okay. So this is this is a, a, a bit of abuse of notation, right? Because okay. this way um, we see vectors in M alone as vectors living here, but somehow not depending on the x variable. And also, uh, these are vector fields here, which are, are vectors here, but which we regard as vectors on the on this direct sum. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> but um, I, I just use this simplified notation to avoid mentioning a lot of pullbacks by, okay. by projections or, or using some um, have otherwise heavy notation. And, but uh, the conclusion is just the same as in the paper of Cordaro and Jimonas, which is that P, which is, th this is a, this is again a real analytic manifold as the product well, Lie groups are always real analytic manifolds and, and, and left invariant vector fields are always real analytic. So the P, the sum of the squares of this ve these vector fields actually minus the sum of their squares is a, is a real analytic operator. And we conclude that P is globally analytic hypoelliptic and omega, okay? Which is basically a new version of the, the, the previous uh, result on the torus. 
Uh, and these results, they are showing a phenomenon where one assumes smooth synfinity hypolipticity, and which is a which is a, a, a local information, and use use it to infer extra regularity regularity globally, but not locally in general. And here, this extra regularity is real analytic. But when what follows, I will mention um, results in which one one does not assume um, anything, any kind of um, regularity locally, but actually one tries to find uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for these, the operators to be global hypolyptic, glo globally hypolyptic without assuming anything local. And again, uh, these results are on the, on the, on the product of two torus. Two tori. And the coefficients are now, are, they are all smooth and real valued. And in 2000, Jimonas and Petronilio, they worked with this kind of operator here. And almost 20 years later, um, Barosti, Ciferra, and Petronilio, they worked with this more general family in which um, we are allowed to actually, here we have only one square of the vector field. Here they, they allowed this to be a, a true sum of squares and also to have some apart depending on, on, the, on the T directions, which is more general than this one. And here we, we have simply the, the Laplacian in the, in the T variable. So, so these, these are some of, some of squares or of vector fields. And in both these words, they, complete, they completely characterize global hyperlipticity. And uh, I should mention that this is like the, the most, as far as I can tell, uh, the most general op operator um, um, of this kind trying, to, trying to, to do this sort of characterization that I am aware of. And, and both, both these correct, the characterizations they show in, in these two works, they are in terms of some Diophantine conditions um, that are computed using the coefficients, this coefficients, either this one, these ones, or these ones. And uh, at, at each new work dealing with this, these kind of operators, the, the, these number theoretic conditions, they get more and more sophisticated. And I'm not gonna, going to, to put an actual definition here because it would take too long and, and it just wouldn't help. But they, 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 they call something like the, the simultaneous approximability of certain families of the vectors or matrices that are computed using the, the coefficients of the of the operator or or the vector fields that that appear in the in the operator, and these conditions may be they may be hard to compute in practice. And uh, what what the reason why these 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 number theoretic conditions they, they appear naturally is due to the, the, the tool that is used to attack the problem, which is partial Fourier series, which is a, a very, um, which is a strong tool, but which is more or less 
a unique feature of, of, of multidimensional tori. And I'm just citing here um, some other other researchers that dealt with um, uh, operators of this kind and, and questions of this kind, but this is a, a hopelessly um, um, short list. I, I'm certainly missing many, many people. I just mentioned the first ones that come, came to me. And, um, but what we wanted to do is to, is just like, uh, just like um, these, this work extended previous results from the torus to more general manifolds, we wanted to extend uh, these, the, the results in this work uh, of the, uh, in, uh, using this very general class of operators but but to more general manifolds than um, a product of two tori. But when you're when you're not in the torus, you have to you have to actually if you wanted to follow the, their steps, you have to try to understand um in a different way what these geofontine conditions mean because you you don't have exactly the partial Fourier series and you don't know exactly what this con this geofontine conditions would mean and so you have to reinter reinterpret them or even replace them um, for something more usable. And here's the framework that we dealt with. Um, for us, M will be a, a compact Riemannian manifold. As I said before, I will not write it, but I'm always assuming everything to be um, connected and oriented for simplicity. And I will take a bunch of Rio smooth and for technical reasons, Q symmetric vector fields with respect to the L2 metric induced by the Riemannian metric. And first, I will just keep the torus here just to, so we can go. Um, baby steps towards where I want it, I want to go. And I will look at this kind of operator where here I am putting the, the, these, these vector fields, which I don't know in principle how, I know how to write them in coordinates, but globally, who knows? We're not assuming that we can write them globally in any specific manner, except that we are assuming that they are skew symmetric. And I'm still putting some smooth coefficients here, just depending on the on the t variable. And here I'm putting the Laplace Beltrami operator associated with the Riemannian metric. So we, we have a, a, a generalization of, of this operator, but where we substituted this manifold, the, this torus by a manifold, which we don't know in principle about the symmetries. So here we have it. Um, and our aim is to find necessary and sufficient conditions for this operator to be globally hypoelliptic. So here I just copy and pasted the, the expression of our, of our general operator. 
And what we are going to do, we are going to assemble a family of vector fields of constant coefficients. And here we were in the, the ambient manifold is M product TM. And now we will assemble a family of constant coefficients vector fields just here, like this. I will fix uh, the, the variable point T at every possible uh, at every possible position, and I will keep generating constant coefficients vector fields of this form for every L and every T, and I will put all of them in a big bag of vector fields. And here we have to recall what would mean uh, for a family of operators to be uh, globally hyperliptic, which mean, meaning that whenever I have a, a, a distribution, here you, you see this, this family lives on just on the torus, so we can forget about the capital M manifold. And we take distributions on the torus such that whenever I take a vector field in our family, L of U is a smooth. And this, is, this works for every vector field in that big bag of vector fields. And provided this, we have that U is smooth. So, um, for instance, if the, this this uh, this calligraphic L is just a set, we 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 have we have no idea if this is a this has no linear structure. It's just a but but we can take the its linear span. Um, it's a family of, of constant coefficient vector fields. So. It's linear span is finite dimensional. Its dimension is at most m. So when 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 its span is 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 has maximal dimension, then we can certainly assert that this family of vector fields is globally hyperliptic in T m. So for instance, uh, uh, this may happen with this kind of operator in which we forget about the, these WLs and we just take the, the combinations of the Xs here, just two of them because we are in the two torus, in which we assume that both of these coefficients are not identically zero, but with their supports uh, disjoint. So um, this, what happens is that at some point, this is not zero. So, and, and, and this is zero because the supports are disjoint. So we, at some point we generate this direction, the X1, and at some other point, the A2 is not zero, but because this, the, the, joint, the, the, the supports of them are disjoint, a one of t is zero at that point, and we can then generate the dx2 direction. So in that case, uh, both dx1 and dx2 belong to this. So uh, when you take, we take it to span, uh, its dimension is two which is what we're looking for in the two torus. Gabriel, can I ask something? Yeah, sure. You mean, so what you mean is that the span over R of the vector fields evaluated at a point? Yeah. OK. Yeah, well, we, we assemble L as a, we go, we, 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 ch we change the, the base point T and keep generating um, uh, constant coefficient combinations of the DXJs. 
So here, for instance, for each t, we have a1 of t times dx1 plus a2 of t times dx2, which is a linear combination of the of dx1 and dx2. And as we change the value of t in, in this coefficient, we keep generating new, uh, new combinations of dx1 and dx2. And at some points, we will generate this, ve the, this, this vector, this direction, actually multiples of that direction. And at some other points, we will generate um, multiples of this direction. So here we have that the dimension. I understand, but I think that the statement is not, you see L is an infinite family. L by itself, as it is, yeah. is a family. And then the span of this infinite family, I mean, in general, no, it's going to be not M, but huge. I mean, infinite dimensional. No, I think that what you No, mean, but, but the, 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 vector fields, the vector fields are, 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 are constant coefficients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They are constant coefficients for, I, I'm, for each T fixed. Yeah. I have a constant constant coefficient vector field. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like this is contained in uh, R M. Yeah. Gerardo, I, I think your mic the is. Excess, uh -huh, the excess are the variables in the totals. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. The the, the, ver the t is the variable here. And x is the variable and the torus. Okay. Okay. This is yeah. Okay. Fine. I, I understood. Thank you. Sure. And so the, the, these guys are are always finite dimensional. Okay. <laughs> and the maximal dimension it can reach is the dimension of the of the torus itself. Okay, which is which is M. So th this is an example where this condition happens, in which case we have that um, uh, calligraphic L is GH in the torus. But uh, if we if we look at it if we fix t either one of these or perhaps both of them will vanish so for a given t fixed this dimension can be at most one either this is not zero or this and perhaps at some points, um, at some t which does not belong, not here and not here, we will have both of them zero. So this is span is zero. And at no point, this space will have total dimension two. But when you when you when you put in a bag. All the possible points, all, all the possible values this can take, and you put you you assemble this set, then it has maximal dimension when you take the, the linear span. So here's another example uh, where here you you, you put only one vector field, but you put one of those vector fields of Greenfield and Wallet for a, a nice choice of constant here, so that this vector field is GH and, and the two torus. So in this case, there's no T to vary. So uh, actually, uh, when you vary T, you, you keep generating always the same vector field with constant coefficients. 
So uh, this, this set has only one element. And because this one element is GH, well, then uh, the family that uh, has just this, this vector field is GH by definition. But of course, uh, it's a span is one dimensional, which is never the, the maximal dimension. So you, you can, there are examples where you can have um, um, many things happening. You can generate um, maximal dimension at some point, at every point, at no point, and you may reach maximal dimension by uh, varying the, the, the point T and, and choosing different directions. But, uh, and, but you can even have that this family is GH without ever, um, uh, ever attaining all the directions using this family alone, okay? But even then, the, the family will itself be GH. And I just copy and paste the, our, our abstract family of vector fields with constant coefficients on the torus here. And after you assemble this family, you just put all these vector fields into a bag. Well, it, it lives on the torus. It, it's, it's in a sense independent of the compact manifold M. I mean, you use the manifold M and the coefficients to generate the family, but after you have it, it's, it, it has a life on its own as a family of vector fields, which lives ever, uh, uh, somewhere else. And as such, it, uh, any properties it might have, like being global, globally hyperelliptic, or in a sense, in that sense, independent of the manifold M. Still, this property of this family being globally hyperelliptic in the torus is precisely equivalent to the Diophantine conditions in that work that inspired us, which is complicated. You have to uh, evaluate a bunch of factors and, and check a bunch of inequalities using um, some very, some very non-intuitive matrices that you assemble using the coefficients. And this is an abstract way to describe those number, number theoretic conditions. Simply saying that this family of vector fields which you generate by uh, locking the T variable at all possible positions and generating constant coefficient vector fields is globally hyperelliptic. And, and this suggests to us that we were on the right track. And that, th that that condition is equivalent to the Geofantin condition follows from this inver invariance property that while um, calligraphic L is in general uh, an infinite family of vector fields, you can always replace it by, uh, in order to check its global hyperlipticity, you can always um, replace it by some finite family, say of generators of its linear span. These properties are equivalent. And then one can try, then you have a finite family of constant coefficient vector fields on a torus. And then you might want to address its global hyperlipticity 
in terms of geofencing conditions, which is now more clear how to proceed because you're dealing only with a finite family. Yeah, a question here. Sure. Yeah, so, uh, so therefore, if R is one, say, if R is one, then this will reduce to the greenfield Wallach condition. Is that correct? If R, little r is one. The global hypolepticity of a single one will be- Yeah, 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 because, yeah. because, because, in, because in, in that case, in that case, you, if you can put this one vector field into that uh, Greenfield and Wallach form, then yes, yes. And, and you, can, you can always, okay. I guess you can always do that by, by a change of variable unless perhaps if the vector field is not global hyperliptic, yeah. but uh, essentially, yes, yes, essentially okay. it's equivalent to, okay. to the Greenfield and Wallach condition, yes. Mm -hmm. and, but you can proceed exactly as they did mm -hmm. and, and to check um, global hyperlipticity of a, of a finite family of constant coefficient vector fields on the torus. And the computations are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And, but now. So do you get, uh, uh, do, you, do you have to look at, uh, is the condition that you get some kind of uh, approximability by Liouville numbers? Yes, in some sense, yes, yes. It will be, it will be equivalent to, uh, to, to uh, a sort of LUV condition. The, these conditions um, that they, these the often conditions that I never state exactly, stated exactly what they are. They are some uh, form of very elaborate um, uh, generalizations of uh, a, a number being Liouville, being a Liouville number, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> And, um, but then if we have this invariant property that we can change um, from one family of generators to another family, I can choose the family that seems best for me to do the, to compute the say Liouville conditions. And, and this is precisely how these conditions arise by choosing a, a very specific and convenient set of generators for the family. Well, this is not how, how Barossi, Ciferra, and Petronilio did in their work. This is a, a, an interpretation uh, uh, of, of their computations. Their conditions arise by choosing a, a very convenient, um, say, frame for our family to, to, to address the, the number theoretic conditions. And actually, we were able to prove that just like they did, but now, um, completely getting completely rid of the torus in the first variable that P is globally hyperliptic if and only if this family of vector fields is globally hyperliptic here, which, which is equivalent to their Diophantine conditions when, when M is a torus. So this is a generalization of their result. Um, Gerardo, I, I'm not um, not following closely the time, but when I when you, when I, when I have to stop, you just please tell me, okay? And Gabriel, uh, if you go to the previous uh, slide, just the one before. Uh huh. So uh, let us look at the lemma. So you mentioned that uh, the condition of uh, Barostichi uh, Ferrar Petronilo 
that uh, there was uh, the condition was stated for a matrix. So is that because you have a system L1 up to R, LR because R can be bigger than one? Is that why you get a matrix? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's why you have to. Mm -hmm. it, that's you. That's why you you have to to resort to a to a matrix to formulation. Yes, you 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 don't you don't have to. You you may think of other ways to do it, but in some sense you have to incorporate all the information the information from all the vector fields. And they did it. They did you. This is more or less natural uh, to use a matrix to. Mm -hmm. to to incorporate all this information okay uh, as i said when an isotaurus is recovered uh, the most general result of barostichifer hypertronidium and also shows that the group structure in the t variable plays no role at all because well we did we, we we achieved the generalization without using it and now i'm gonna try to tell you a bit about how much can we uh, play now with the i mean we just messed with this manifold now we want to to change this one too So again, um, M will be a compact Riemannian manifold, and the Ws will be real smooth skew-symmetric vector fields. But now we will change the, the second torus by a compact Lie group. Here we will um, forget about commutativity, but we still have the group structure, which might be non-abelian. Now, uh, by the German uh, small g, we, I will denote the Lie algebra of left invariant vector fields on g. And I will take a basis of left invariant vector fields. And we will perform the, the most naive substitution we can think of, which is take the previous. Uh, the previous operator in which we had here the DXJs and the, in, in the torus, and we will substitute them by the basis of the, these basic vector fields. And we will work on the product of M and G. Again, we, we, we have smooth coefficients here. And our aim is again to characterize global hyperlipticity. And now we we try to play the, the, the to, to, to play the same trick that we did before. We look at this expression here. And for each t in m fixed, we have a constant coefficient combination of the xj's so we we are uh, we are generating vector fields here meaning left invariant vector fields on the manifold g on the lead group g so we keep varying t and generating these left invariant vector fields they are all here and we put all of them in a big bag of vector fields. And just like before, it's, it's not too much hard to prove. It's a bit tricky because of the presence of the vector fields WL, but anyway, that if P is globally hyperliptic in the product, then this family of vector fields is globally hyperliptic in G. Uh, this is only an if then statement, um, which is the easy part. But we are we wanted to to we 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 
we wanted to prove a converse for this. We want a complete characterization of the global hypothesis of P in terms of this family of vector field, just as we did in the previous case. And we had to assume, we don't know if that's true, if we can prove the converse like this, but we, we could prove, prove a converse with some extra hypothesis for which I have to introduce some notation here. And for each T and each L, I will denote it by this, this left invariant vector field, T is fixed here. So this is just a linear combination of XJs, which is a, ve uh, a left invariant vector field on G. So using this notation, our family of vector fields is just the set of all ALTs when T and L vary at all possible positions. And here's our theorem. And we suppose that the family L is globally hyperliptic in G. But also we had to put this extra condition that for each L given, when you vary T, these two defined by this, they commute. This doesn't mean that when I change L's, the vector fields will commute, but when if I, if I, if for each L fixed, I can vary T and these vector fields will commute. And with these hypotheses, we were able to prove that P is globally hyperliptic in M product G. And this is the, the property that we don't know if it's, it's necessary. It's, it's technical for the proof. Um, actually, we'd like to prove the theorem without it, but the as we are assuming that the Lie group G could be non-abelian, the, the computations uh, get very, very messy. And in some sense, this is what we, we, we try to break our operator in some commutative blocks in which we can we can do the computations um, a little easier and but also uh, being able to produce interesting examples which are not on the torus. One thing that we, we, we have always to be very careful when dealing with E groups is that if you if you're not very careful with the hypothesis you pick, you might be you might end up talking about the torus anyway because you put some hypothesis that all only happen when you are in the torus, so you, you have to be very, very careful with this. If, if, you, if you want to create a new theory that is not just a, a fancy way of talking about the, the, the old theory. Actually, you see, uh, say you, you want an easy way out from this. So you ask that L is both commutative and GH. This is hypothesis can only happen if G is a torus, surprisingly. So, so this is the kind of hypothesis that you can put in your theorem because it will just, uh, 
It will always be false in the non-commutative setup. And in a torus, you already have the theorem. So this is, and as I said, our condition is is more it, it's it's finer than this one because it, it doesn't ask for the whole family to be commutative. It just asks for a commutative of certain blocks within this family. So this is a, a kind of very simple example. Uh, you take like in in any Lie group. Uh, there are many Lie groups which are not commutative, high dimensional Lie groups in which you can generate the whole Lie algebra using only two vectors, two left invariant vector fields. Not, not, do, not by just doing linear combinations, but also uh, taking brackets. Um, this happens precisely when the Lie group is very non-commutative because otherwise uh, it's, it's when it, it, it would be simply the two torus. Then we can look at this kind of operator, which is very simple for our standards, uh, which is GH in the product by our theorem if and only if these coefficients are both non identically zero. Because in this case, At some point t, I will generate the L1 direction. At some, because B1 is not zero. At some other point, because B2 is not identically zero, I may generate the L2 direction. So taking the commutators of these two directions, which lie here, I may generate the whole Lie algebra. So this, this is telling us precisely that the Lie algebra generated by L is the whole G, in which case one can prove that the original family L is GH in G. But for each L, um, which or just one and two, because we have only two blocks here in our sum of squares. Uh, each block is just one dimensional. So clearly commutative whenever you change, you change the, the T because they are always generating the same direction. So our block commutative condition is ensured. So by our theorem, we have that this operator P is GH in the product. And this, can, this works in many Lie groups, which are not the torus. And I was going to tell you something about um, solvability in relation to this, but I guess I'm a, I'm a little out of time. So I'm finishing here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Gabriel. That was very nice. Uh, if you have questions, I'll. Uh... Yeah, Gerardo, I have a question. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, Gabriel, uh, in these results, so let's look at this screen P equal to the Laplace Beltram in M plus blah, blah. So what is, uh, you, uh, you didn't say anything about the role of the Laplace Beltrami operator. Uh, can you replace it with some other elliptic operator, for example, or hyperelliptic for that matter? On uh, yeah, exactly. We, we believe that we can replace, replace it by, well, um, 
an elliptic, um, perhaps with some extra hypothesis, a second order, um, some um, hypothesis on its symmetry. We believe it's true that we can replace replace Laplace Beltrami by many things, but um, in our technique, which we were not adapt to, we were not able to. Well, actually, for this part of the statement, the Laplace Beltrami, the the leading term, if you if you if you'd like, uh, plays no role plays absolutely no role. It can be anything. Yeah. But but the question is about the converse. Right. And our technique relies on obtaining some energy estimates for the operator. And um, the let me look for the default operator here. And uh, for the, this, we, we we weren't able at, up to this point to adapt to more general leading terms here. But, but yes, we, we believe we, it's possible to, to replace this by something else. Can I ask, what is a skew symmetric vector field? Maybe, maybe it's obvious, but I cannot think. Uh, with respect to the L2 norm in M, it's just that uh, one that. So this is some, some sort of a killing vector field then. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some sort of killing vector field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, here, okay. Uh, for smooth. F and G, real. Well, everything is real here. Everything is real here. Yeah. So it has to. It has to. It has to preserve the. So it has the lead derivative of the of the metric with respect to the vector field has to be equal to zero. Yeah. 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 It preserves the volume form. Yeah. Longer, yeah. Uh, yeah. Due to a longer, right? A longer. Volume. Yeah. Actually, the the volume form. Yes. The lead derivative of the volume. Okay. 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 So he, if uh, if so, you had somewhere uh, this lemma that um, let's see what was the lemma. The lemma was that if you have L one and up to L R that they generate the span of the script L, then hyperlipticity, global hyperlipticity of one and, and the other was the same, okay, which is kind of, it's an elementary thing, no? Yeah, but, yeah, uh, it's pretty uh, elementary, yeah. Is it, uh, there is no, no guarantee that, for instance, if you have that the, that the, that L is globally, Hyperliptic, then you do have this finite family because everything depends on having the finite family, right? Because this is then you can, you know, jump to the at least in this part of the of the of the problem, you can jump back to the to the diophantine uh, situation, no? but you mm -hmm. need the finitely many generators, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no way of 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 proving from 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 generating from 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 uh, L being globally hyperliptic, that you have that you only need finitely many things to have a globally hyperliptic thing. No? Mm -hmm. You see, when you have globally globally hyperliptic, maybe because you, you have all these brackets and stuff. Well, yes, I mean this this actually allows you to put in brackets because uh, because mm -hmm. uh, except that this is in a torus, so so I don't know. Yeah, here, here in the Taurus, we but 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 this uh, this lemma, of course, holds in a in a, a much more general situation. It, it holds in, in the in the non-abelian case as well. It has, I think, it here just to. It, it has nothing to do with the Taurus. Mm -hmm. This lemma. Mm -hmm. 
And actually, you can replace by the you you can not only replace L by its linear span, you can replace it by its the Lie algebra generated by by L, which here makes no sense because you're in the yeah, torus, yeah. but but it's pretty important when you are in the non-commutative case. In the non yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? I think we're running out of time actually. More questions? Okay, then. Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. Next, thank you. Yeah. So the information for next uh, for next uh, Monday is posted already. So, so I'm not going to repeat it here. Okay. Yeah. Um. Everybody who wants to stay and talk a little bit more, of course, you're welcome.